Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This is going to be a, a really good discussion. Uh, I think we call this the decoupling of, of you know, uh, automotive retail. Um, we're going to get into a lot of topics here. Uh, before we start, though, a couple of housekeeping items. First, we're using Zoom for this. So if you hover over uh, the, the Zoom window at the bottom, you'll see that there's a chat function. Ho pop that open. Uh, we'd love to take questions and just comments from, from people on this uh, as we navigate through these, these fun times. Uh, in addition to that, anybody who registered for this broadcast is going to get the recording uh, emailed to them. So I know that we're all in dealerships, stuff's going on. You know, you probably have a few things that you're working on at one time. And so if you miss something or if you want to play this back and share it with somebody else, you'll be able to do that with the recording. So uh, that's all I've got. Without further ado, We've got Ron Fry and Bryce Ingler, Ingert on this call. I, I, I butchered your time, Bryce. Blurt. It's, it's, it, Glurt is the tough, that tough part to say. Yeah. So um, Ron is an automotive strategist, and his specialty is automotive innovation and technology. Uh, he had a 35-year executive career in the automotive industry, and now he's an active investor and advisor, as well as a director on certain corporate and nonprofit boards. Ron, welcome. And then we've got Bryce. Everyone. Yeah, Bryce is the CEO of Trade Pending, and he's a passionate product innovator. Uh, after 10 years in the industry buying and running companies, he began Trade Pending uh, in 2014. And through the last seven years, uh, they've experienced quite a bit of growth and multiple product launches, and they're in 3,000 franchise dealers across the U.S., and we're going to talk. Well, welcome, Bryce. Sorry. To Thank you. To good to, good to be here, Mark. Fast. Yeah. We're going to talk through some really, really good questions. We've got a couple of people uh, on this on this broadcast that, that have a little bit of knowledge in, in, in what's going on in automotive. And from there, we're going to kind of once again ask any questions that come through and we'll just have a, a really good dialogue around this. So um, let, let's kind of begin with you, Ron. Um, we called this, or you called this, the decoupling of the used car to the news car transaction. I really I, I dig that phrase, the decoupling of that. Can you can you kind of elaborate a little bit more on, on what you mean by that? Yep, happy to. And Bart, first of all, again, thank you for inviting us here today and thrilled to be part of your program and participate uh, today. So thank you. And yeah, look, I think um, it's it's an important topic for, you know, for the marketplace today. And he, here's here's a bit of the thesis is that if we go back to the beginning days of CarMax, CarMax is one of their best kind of kept secrets and superpowers was their ability to acquire used cars directly from the, the public. And and I remember back in some of my strategy days um, with um, large retail group was, look, one of our biggest challenges was not having our own salespeople tell people to go to CarMax to get a bid for, you know, for the vehicle. Like we actually had to work to not have people send people to CarMax. And, but it was CarMax. They had a decade of kind of a free ride of acquiring vehicles directly from consumers. And historically, like a consumer had one of two options. Like I, I sold the vehicle on my own through classifieds or when I bought a new car, you know, when I was at the dealer, I negotiated a trade-in and that trade-in was very much integrated into my new car, my new car transaction. If you fast forward today, and this isn't just a, um, this isn't just a result of kind of the current, you know, environment and pandemic, this is just the evolution of auto retail. There are many options for consumers, legitimate options for consumers to get an instant upfront value on their car for, from many providers. And so whether it's, you know, through, I don't even need them all, but through many providers, I can go on as a consumer and I can spend four minutes of my time and I can have a dozen legitimate on the money bids for a car that I could take in somewhere within a 20 mile radius of where I live, and I don't care where you live, and somebody's going to cut a check for that vehicle, no questions asked, 
and I'm going to turn my vehicle into cash. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't the case outside of CarMax, let's say, even five years ago. And so now as a consumer, I'm empowered. I'm empowered. I can go negotiate a value on a new car and I can sell my used car separately. And outside of states where there's the, you know, some of the tax overlap issues, the majority, in, I have options as a consumer. And when I have options as a consumer, and now if I'm a dealer and I want to play with that, now all of a sudden I have to put vehicles on the money, it drives value up, but, but it, it changes the game. So it's a long way of saying from a consumer standpoint, I am no longer tied to the new car transaction to trade in my used car. It has now been and forever will be decoupled from the transaction. That does not mean that dealers won't win a majority of the trade-ins. It does not mean that people won't be trading in their, their vehicles. Like I believe that that, like while it's been decoupled from, from having to do it that way, I believe that dealers will still win. They just need to change their methodology and process to win. So I'll, I'll stop there and see if that made sense, Bart. Yeah, Bryce, maybe you can speak a little bit to this. When I when I was selling cars in, in the dealership, if someone came in and said, "I don't want to buy a car; I just want to sell you mine," you just laugh them off, laugh them out of the out of the building. It's very short sighted. Yeah. But the the way it is now, you know, this this decoupling has happened. It the two aren't mutually exclusive. They they don't have to. They they they're not tied together. And and you know how how are you seeing how are you seeing things shape up? Uh, in your experience and, and with and at trade pending? This, this may be my favorite topic. Uh, I'd say 60% of the reason that I started trade pending was this topic. And, and, and being in the industry for 10 years, I saw a couple of uh, uh, really, really kind of openings. Uh, you know, one, you know, the way that we have communicated as an industry, uh, and I include B2C companies in our industry and, and, and also, of course, dealers, around value of this really important asset, a vehicle, which normally it's a depreciating asset. We know it's actually not. It can be an appreciating asset. We'll get into that, I'm sure. But the way we communicate about uh, the, you know, value has been you know, really in the Stone Ages. It was, it was a you know, single, single point of, of reference. Here's a number. Trust me. You know? and, and that's not good enough for consumers with any other asset that you buy and sell. You look, you do research, you look at comps, you inform yourself to understand, you know, ultimately the big question in your head is, am I getting a good deal? You need context. And so in 2014, we came out with our own valuation methodology that was tailored after how local dealers in the end determine what they should pay for a car, what an acquisition cost should be based on what they can retail it for uh, and how long it's going to take them to retail that. So, uh, I'm a, I'm a big lover of data. I follow NADA data every year. And here's a couple of interesting facts. In 2000, the percentage of used vehicles retailed uh, that came from trade was 64%. In 2020, that number is now 71%. So I've been in the industry for about a decade. We talk about wholesale channels. We talk about auction. There's been great innovations. Think of all the, the market cap, the billions of dollars in value there is in those types of channels. But only a fraction of cars that dealers have retailed historically, usually about 25%, you know, come from those channels. The majority channel is the trade. And so we really got started to say, how can we share more information? How, we can, how can we change the dealer's game, be a brand that supports theirs and an, an, an enabler for used vehicle acquisition? So we did that with our trade tool. We've done it with some other products as well. We've done it with our guaranteed offer program that's backed by the dealership's brand, not a third party they have to compete with. And so everything that Ron just said is, 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 is really a foundational element of, of our company. And you know, for us, uh, we are long-term invested in helping dealers you know, continue to fight this, 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 this huge war against all the new entrants that want that consumer-owned vehicle too. So they've got to be armed with technology. They've got to be armed with process. They've got to be ready to communicate with consumers at a totally different level. Uh, and, and, and that's going to be the winning formula, I think, for the long term. And yeah, maybe you two can speak a little bit to that. You said they've got to be armed with process. I've, I've, I've you know, I've, I've talked to some dealers that, that have, they're compensating salespeople for taking that vehicle in just as much as they compensate them for selling another vehicle. The, the, the the value of that and i think that it speaks to process and it speaks to 
you know, structuring your dealership in such a way that that when somebody comes in to trade a car in, it, it, it's a it's a welcome it's a welcome thing. Um, what are some what are some changes or shifts you've seen dealerships? Um, uh, I guess de- some things that you've seen them deploy to help them make this more of a more of an initiative in, inside of the store. Sure, I'll, I'll start off, Ron, if you don't mind. Uh, you know, I think I think if you look further, even upstream, Bart, right? Because the theme here that we you know were describing was what what are consumers going to do before they walk in the door? You know, so. Uh, the process starts when the consumer is doing research, and we know that uh, you know consumers are coming to every dealer website, you know, to to look at vehicles. Uh, uh, we do surveys and recognize that that consumers value a dealer's website, you know, more than a third party site. I think they know they get a full unencumbered view of inventory versus say an ad platform like most P2C portals. And so it starts there, you know, and you've got to be able to engage the consumer at whatever point of the process that they're willing to go through. They may not be ready to go through a full full four minute process to get a guaranteed offer. So maybe you want to start a conversation, you know, like we do with our market report, you know, just giving somebody a range, you know, here's what we know about your car, you know, and then when you engage with the consumer, by the way, Make sure you've got the internal process that matches what the consumer's interest was. If they engage with that call to action by your trade, are your, is your BDC or your folks following up to say, tell me more about your car? Good open-ended question, right? Versus, hey, you know, Bart, what are you looking to buy? You know, hence your first story when I tried to trade your car, you just sent me over to CarMax. Uh, so it starts at the high end of the funnel. And if the consumer then engages in the next uh, portion of the funnel, you know, i.e. getting a guaranteed offer, um, then, the, you know, you have a, a custom process there that fits your dealership. You've got a methodology back behind it, and you're ready to then to engage with that consumer to get him in the door. Now that he's in the door, how consistent are you with the information and the engagement points that the consumers already had to get them to that ACB, that, that final offer, and listen to the consumer? Right. If they are truly ready to be decoupled, they may say, look, I've already got a unit over here. I'm interested. But, you know, your offer was more attractive for this vehicle that I own than the other guys. Take the deal. That's a win. And be ready for more and more of those transactions, frankly, uh, that are going to happen. That's my view. Very, very interesting. Very interesting. Um, And I I, I love the concept that that you kind of talked around a little bit of you know, the, the BDC team following up on that, like it's a lead, right? Them trading a car in is a lead, almost like somebody looking to purchase a vehicle from you. It's a way to get that inventory back in. I, I predict, and sorry, Ron, Ron, I know he's getting ready to say something much more brilliant than me, but I, <laughs> but I fully predict, you know, uh, for decades now, I've been talking about, you know, cost per lead, you know, conversion rates for leads. And what do we match that up to against uh, in the CRM? A unit sold. Where did that come from? Where did that opp- opportunity come from? And we spend money in our industry to do what? Sell sell cars. That's going to change. It's already changing. We're going to spend money on used vehicle acquisition. We're going to advertise ourselves as a buying center. We are going to develop you know custom process and tools you know that fits you know the Englert Auto Group way, whatever that that that, that may be. So you know. I see a future where, you know, we are really tracking closely, you know, cost per vehicle acquired. And what are the sources for those opportunities, whether it's a Facebook click or, you know, it can be an auction purchase still, but what are we, what kind of energy and investment are we expending to get units on our lot, which are clearly hard to get today? Look, I think the only thing I'll add, Bryce, I think you said it perfectly, um, is that in light of what I just said, that consumers have choice and the choice is real and legitimate. You have to have a process that is equal or better than options that consumers can have outside your store. So your process has to be, in fact, that you better be on the money, you better make it really easy and make it instant. And your process, to Bryce's point, should not be directly tied to the sale of a new car. Like you should even decouple your own process and engage consumers. And if you do it right, it could result in more new car transactions because you're engaging people at the top of the, of the funnel. So it, this is, it's critical. This is an inflection point. That's interesting. Um, Robert just asked, what's a good best practice number for the cost of vehicle acquired? You kind of mentioned that, Bryce. I don't know how early on we are, we are with this. Do you have dealers that are measuring this and, and do you have a number? 
we don't have a specific number yet, but let, let's let's let me try to answer the question. You know, you know really well. Today, if you bought a car at auction, what are you paying? What's the transaction fee? Three hundred bucks. All right. How many of those do you have to pay for transport? What's the average transport? All right. Four fifty, five hundred dollars. Uh, so you know now we understand what does it take to get that car on my lot, and then you have reconditioning expenses, so on and so forth. So we're already sitting at seven eight hundred bucks. You know just through that one channel. And so if we apply that standard, you know, into our own ad opportunities, if you're, you know, retailing 100 units a month, you're buying 70 of those from consumers 70 times. I mean, it's big money. You can invest a lot of money. So, you know, we're already rooted to the old ways of purchasing, you know, wholesale or auction plus transport. And how can we now create efficiencies to, to, to not be dependent upon that channel? Because let's face it, there's fewer opportunities. The new guys are doing deals to take vehicles out of that environment and directly through their platform already today. So second part of the question, I think, you know, was how much does CarMax spend? Um, I, I, I don't know. That's easy math to actually do if I looked at their K1. Uh, Ron, maybe you've studied that before. Uh, but, you know, it's, 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 it's very expensive. You know, CarMax has different uh, uh, scalable advantages, you know, on, on distributing vehicles to where they can retail. But if anything we've learned in the last two years is guess who owns the local retail market? Dealers. Right. So you blend in cost of acquisition plus reconditioning and advertising. And in the end, that sets the retail market. I, I'm not I'm not going to you've mentioned auction a few times here, and I'm not going to sit here and say the auctions are going to go the way of the dinosaur. No. But but this this inner this movement, this decoupling has how, how has it impacted the auctions? You have dealers that, you know, they're they've close to eliminated the need to go to the auction if the cars if we're getting in front of the customer before a car gets to that point um how is this going to impact them are the cars at the auction just you know i don't want to retail it i'm going to wholesale it and and our our what is that what is that change done do you think or what's it going to do so look i i that's a it's a complicated question yeah Bart. i i think the way I think to bring it back to what like probably the audience, how they should think about it is this. There is exponentially more competition in the marketplace going after used car and then, you know, used car inventory. And your sources, not unlike how consumers opportunities and sources to sell the vehicle have expanded, our dealer partners have also expand their sources of where they're going to acquire the vehicle. So whether it's physical auctions or online auctions, it will never supply your appetite and your need for use, access to used car inventory. And so if you're relying on whatever form of auction that is to supply your vehicles, you're going to fail. And so as as the business changes and you're and you're shifting your profit centers and you really want to because I think you have to get to this one to one mindset of new to used car transaction you're not going to get it through trade ins you have to be aggressive on trade ins and you have to think about how do I drive more people into my store that gives me access to inventory in a with an unfair opportunity and it's through all the channels that are opening up today and so whether that's online auctions physical auctions marketplaces that exist, your own tools to drive consumers through, it has got to be a core competency of your organization to compete going forward. Yeah. So we, we yeah. have a whole debate about, about disruption around auctions, but I, I, I think the other message is probably more key for this audience. Makes a lot of sense, yeah. I, I agree, and one example is just lease returns. You know, so, so lease returns require a totally different process today than they did two years ago. Why is that? Because every one of those lease returns is in equity. It's worth a lot more retail than it is the residual value. So if you're still practicing the same process of trying to steal a lease or just, you know, take keys or what, what stop, you know, you've, you've got to now talk to the consumer and educate him how you're going to give them a check, you know, for their vehicle. Ideally, you've got something to get them into, but, uh, don't, don't run to your, you know, yesterday's process in an environment. Lease returns are going to continue to go down. I think lease rates have gone down from you know tw high twenties to to high teens, but that's still a constant source of supply for many dealers in many markets. And so that that's just one example of really really polishing your game. Yeah. So you know we're we're talked a lot about I mean, 
you know, I have, I have a friend that, that totaled a vehicle and he had to fight with the, the, the uh, lease company, the bank, because it was worth more than, than, you know, his, his pay offers guarantee future value. So uh, that's interesting. And it's all, it's all due to this. There's a scarcity. Uh, it's hard to get vehicles and there's not a lot of ton of them out there. Um, do you see this as a short-term problem? What, how, how are we going to exit out of this or how, what does yeah. that look like? Yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of theories you see floating around about what's going to happen to use, use cars, you know, this, the used car price and, and availability. And I'll, I'll give you simply, you know, my point of view. Um, look, I, I don't think that there's some, some cliff to this accelerated pricing that we've seen on used vehicles. And I don't think there's some like inflection point where, where supply is gonna get better. I think this is very much our new norm. And for a variety of reasons I'll share with you. And, and while I think that we see a, a bit of a normalization you know, to some of the inflections that we've seen, I think this is very much what we, what we live with for some time. And, and here's the reason why is the landscape has materially changed for us. So again, if I'm a retailer, a franchise dealer, I really do have to get to a one-to-one -one ratio of new to use car to have, to have a balanced portfolio going forward. It is now a best practice. And the most progressive dealers, our public dealers are all opening up very large and sophisticated used car operations. Uh, so not only is a one-to-one -one in their normal core business essential, but I'm now supplying used car inventory to support all the used car standalone centers. And then I have a that is sucking inventory out of the marketplace. CarMax is growing larger. Vroom is in the marketplace. And there's a myriad of others and a massive consolidation still coming. And on top of that, Bart, remember I talked about the decoupling of the used car transaction. Again, it's been decoupled. So consumers have the choices of all these places to go. And so what's the result of that? There's, I have dealers with an insatiable appetite for used car inventory, they should. And I have tremendous more competition in the market going after those used car inventory. And I have consumers that have choice that's gonna drive pricing up. That's not going to change. In fact, I'm gonna argue it actually gets more competitive in the future for a, for a variety of, of, of reasons. So I think this is our new norm. So if if you're sitting back and you're scared to inventory up and you think the prices are going to have this massive fall and inventory is going to you know, somehow become available, like this is just some inflection point and things are going to go back to norm, um, I don't think you're going to be on the winning side of the ledger. Yeah. And I, I think it goes uh, to today. We, we, you've, you've got to take all the facts that Ron just mentioned and recognize that you know, sales feed service, service feed sales. So how many months are we away from you know, the supply problems that we've had and knew, as well as the constraints on use supply affecting you know, ultimately our service opportunities? You know, that is, is even a bigger issue. And, and another reason why you gotta get to one-to-one -one or better, you know, depending upon whatever your absorption rate you know, historically has been and, and, and how you operate, it's, it's a really big deal. So if you don't have the cars, you don't have the service opportunities. And it all goes back to that consumer owned vehicle and trying to acquire them. Uh, from a time perspective, uh, I, I went to a few different uh, interesting events in the last few months where I tried to listen to some economists and things like that. And there are a myriad of, uh, of perspectives. Uh, but you know, what I'm hearing a common theme of is that the pinup demand is greater than what the supply channels are going to uh, provide on the, on the new car side for probably the next 20 months. You know, we're looking into the end of 2023. So this is not a gimmick. This is not just, hey guys, let's put together a marketing campaign to go buy 30 uh, used units. This is a change in dealership operation for the long term. And I do think, I do agree with Ron. <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is the new norm, you know. This is the new norm. We're talking about decoupling new from used. I kind of hit on it a little bit before. And I don't know, Bryce, if you're close enough to, to this to be able to speak to it. If not, just tell me to stop. And it's a dumb idea and dumb question. But I'm really interested on the what, what structure changes for personnel-wise or process-wise are dealers making? Maybe that's a little 
a little um, outside of dead center that to, to kind of make sure that they're optimizing and taking advantage of this. You mentioned marketing, you know, used car super centers or we'll buy your car, things yeah. like that. But from a process or a structure standpoint, what are dealers doing that's, that seems to really be working? It, it's not a, a dumb question at all. Uh, and I try to stay tuned in, but although it's hard because I see a lot of dealers trying uh, uh, different things. So here are a few examples. You know, uh, I lightly touched on, you know, buying centers. You know, that, that's, that's all about marketing and getting the word out uh, and, and partnering with technology to be able to deliver these offers uh, in an efficient manner. And then you can uh, 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 take that platform and, and you can, you can uh, uh, advertise for it, you know, as much as you can and measure, measure what you are, are, are getting out of that. Uh, num number two, uh, you know, which is totally different than the single used car manager that you used to have who said, great, you know, here's a huge budget, go buy, you know, used cars, right? That, it, that, that, that's over, right? Now we've got to have, you know, this notion of buying centers and teams of people, you know, that are, that are responsible for that, including BDC reps, you know, that are trained and all they do want to, all they want to do is, is, is buy cars. At the extreme of that, I've seen uh, dealers stand up one uh, just down the road from me in a small town, Mebane, North Carolina. They buy 100 units from consumers off Facebook each month. So they have used a few tool tools and technology to help efficiencies, but in the end, they've got a team of three or four folks that do nothing but absolutely hammer folks trying to buy used cars across the country, setting up transportation, and having good success with it, but that's his that that's his new norm. You know, that's his new staff. Uh, that's his new process. And uh, if you go by his lot, guess what? It's it's filled. So um, those are just a few examples. Uh, uh, I, I think you know if you're a dealership versus a dealer group, there's 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 differences with how you can approach that. The latter example that I just gave you was a is a single point store. You know, and, uh, and and his payrolls changed. His incentives have changed for the people on his team. Yeah, I think that's a big key. Well, Ron, we brought you on here to talk maybe big picture other than the decoupling, which is, you know, I've talked about how cool I think that phrase is. Um, what, what, are, what are your takes? Um, what do you think the macro trends are going to do in the used car market? What, you know, how, how should we be looking at this? That's a, that's, a, that's a great question. And, and I'll hone in on the way you asked it. Like there's so many macro trends, but I'm going to, I'm going to hone in on, because we're talking about used cars, I'll just give you a mindset there of how I'm thinking about it. Um, look, I've been, I've been in this for 36 years and it's been fascinating for me of how many inflection points we've had, you know, in 36 years of this industry changing. And um, it's been an exciting journey. And I don't think ever more exciting than where we are to, where we are today but we're at a different inflection point i remember when when we saw auto nation you know come into the market and how how you know our, how disrupted that felt with this idea of like the beginning of consolidation of new car franchises and that started this this cascade of um tech innovation that began to enable larger dealers getting larger in the publics and the innovation around it. And look at the journey we've seen in the last 20 years um, around the change of new car franchises. I would say we're in a different inflection point, And this time it's around the independent, like the used car space is what we've been talking about today. And and while CarMax has been at it for a long time, again, I think they've been just this kind of little best kept secret. I think Carvana woke up the marketplace mm -hmm. and they woke up the marketplace and said, wait a minute, like there's 17 million units, you know, historically traded on new vehicles, but there's 40 million units traded annually on used cars. And mm -hmm. there's a lot less barriers, you know, on the used cars and there's a lot more margin on the used cars. And it's a highly fragmented, mostly dominated by independent shops. And it is ripe, 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 ripe for consolidation. And with consolidation becomes tech enablement and it begins to change the entire marketplace. We're at the beginning of that journey. And you're seeing, you're seeing acquisitions happening, platforms starting to be built around that independent space. You're seeing 
new car franchise dealers that are beginning to build out infrastructure around standalone used car place you're seeing all the stuff we've been talking about and for those reasons it's why i'm also saying that this is not a short-term trend this is very much a future trend and i think that the the supply like it's a finite supply like i don't get to just go manufacture more used cars right and so there's a there's a finite supply it's going to you know supply and demand is going to drive up prices and if i'm in this business today in the groups that we love and serve and i'm going to steal this term but our dealers that are on this call need to become used car factories and so you have to rethink everything in light of this macro change that's happening in front of us. I see it as a massive opportunity. Mm -hmm. And um, but you've got to lean in and you got to know that this is a trend that's only going to get more competitive, more consolidation, more tech enablement. And so how do I take advantage of it and win? And I think it's pretty exciting. Yeah, and, and I'm clearly vested in the tech enablement part of the you know this and trade pending wants to be you know in the middle of this 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 change uh it's going to be you know transformative for for, for decades uh, but i think for for dealers I'll also add there there is more innovation today than ever before on the vendor side uh, the way that we can develop software and solutions and listen to our dealers and 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 lean in and find scalable solutions they don't they don't change their operations they don't need to be tech operations they they just need to you know to to, to understand you know business goals and align the right partners to meet those business goals uh, but it's a it's a really healthy market for vendors to innovate and help dealers and so i'm fascinated with what's going to be coming over the next two years not just from trade penny but from the general market because with new problems come great ways to to solve them and and that's our job so uh it's it's going to be fun to watch yeah this is such a great discussion um robert said you're saying that once the manufacturers start building and resupplying the rental companies that will not provide enough inventory to restore normalcy uh, I, for, for robert for you to i mean look you know as well as i do you, you if, if you rely on program vehicles to supply your used car inventory, you're not going to be successful, right? And so you need the full gamut. And so, yes, that is a source, but that is not going to be a big enough source. The auctions will be a source, whether it's online or physical, but it won't be a big enough source. And so the question for you is, like, if you want to get to whatever volume you want in used cars, how do you compete to be a, an acquisition machine to get the right vehicle? Like, first of all, know what the right vehicles are, get the right vehicles into your system, and then turn them. Um, and it's not just going to be rental, you know, rental fleet coming back. And by the way, like you don't have enough time for that either. So, like, yeah. you, like you're not waiting two years for that supply to get built, you know, production out there, and then turn either. Like you, like you and I are going to be you know, out of business before that happens, if, if we wait for it. Right. Yes, yeah, I, I agree. Hard. Well, uh, do you have any closing remarks that you want to put on this? I mean, you've, you've kind of put a, put a big stamp on the, on the topic and, and answered my questions, but, uh, you know, Bryce, maybe we start with you. Any, anything to kind of, I, I just, on there to kind of recap. I'm, I'm, I'm always so proud to be part of an industry, you know, that that, that has gone through the, uh, what we had the last two years and, and shown resiliency. I've been doing a little studying on the, you know, the, you know, gas price increases and uh, get a kick of, you know, trying to read about the 70s, you know, and what happened, how that affected our industry, so on and so forth. Then we have supply challenges, then we have this and that. I mean, you know, it, it, dealers and, and, and dealer partners, you know, are, are going to work through all these issues. And we've, we've shown this resiliency. And, um, you know, so while we talk about maybe, you know, scary things, changing businesses and changing models and things like that, the reality is that we've, we've done incredibly well the last two years. And I think the future is incredibly bright. Uh, 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 EVs, this and that. So, I mean, there's, there's so many exciting themes to, to, to follow and get involved in the automotive industry. Uh, but, you know, at, at the root of it all is distribution and, uh, and selling vehicles. And uh, we've, we've always had a, a lot of strength and, and really sharp operators in automotive. So. 
So thanks, Bryce. Um, look, I think first of all, it's 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 crazy to be at this end of my career. Like you know, 35, 36 years went by really fast. And and I always hate when I make these statements, but I've been at this a long time, and I can't tell you how many how many predictions of the demise of the dealer that we've seen. And um, like when and instead of the demise of the dealer, every one of these been have been opportunities that only have made us bigger, stronger, and frankly, even more profitable. And, and I've been on the innovation side of that, where I've taken advantage of all of these inflection points. The trick is, is, is A, just recognizing them and then saying, how do I shift and take advantage of these inflection points to frankly have an unfair share, you know, advantage and win. And that's what I see all these things. If we just simply recognize what's coming our way and then how do we adjust our business I think we're always in a position to win. I love automotive. I love dealers. We're resilient. And uh, I see nothing, you know, but I, hard work, you know, challenge, but upside going forward. Yeah, Rob, Robert's got a, a long comment here. Uh, one thing that I want to uh, just underscore, and everybody can read the chat. Uh, it was a great uh, webinar. That's all I said. That yeah, was, no, I didn't see anything. No, what I love about what he said, though, Bryce, is he said, it's always been that way. You know, you go to used car managers from the 80s, they'll tell you the money's made when you buy the car, right? right. And right. and the way that we were using that was they were using it to say, you got to buy it right. You buy it right, you make the money. When you when you buy it, you buy the right car. But I think that you can kind of shift that a little bit. The money's made when you buy the car. You need to be able to buy the cars, get the right cars, right? And, and, and what you're saying is decouple. Don't worry about the sales of the car. It's important. But, but look at different ways to purchase these cars so that you can. Yeah. It, it, it's true. Yeah. Robert's comment, you know, uh, you know, hard to control the mix, you know, of inventory absent, you know, robust wholesale inventory. Well, you know, uh, if you assume robust wholesale inventory, you know, is only going to be even more competitive and even less available, then you have fewer options than to look at, all right, so how are we going to operate differently with our advertising and outreach? Um, you know, maybe flipping that, that funnel on the other side, Robert, you know, to, to recognize like we're going to spend a lot of dollars to attract, you know, a large pool of opportunities of which we're going to be very aggressive on the ones that we know we're going to turn fast and make a lot of money. Uh, the example of the, uh, the small dealer in Nevin, North Carolina, uh, of the 100 units that he buys, you know, sight unseen, he's making offers and, and, and asking very few questions, ultimately, to put money on these vehicles. He'd tell you 10% of those he loses, like, that, like oh, God, boy, I shouldn't have done that. 10%, he crushes it. And 80%, he does just fine. So in the end, it's a numbers game, right? So create that used car factory, as Ron said. And I think as you hone the way that you are putting money on cars in the end, um, you know, be prepared you know, to lose on a few, win big on a few, but really win overall um, you know, on the lion's share. And I, and I, think, I think you'll find that you can get that, that, that mix, which the second point of his comment is right. The right mix today is a mix. So <laughs> wouldn't that be great if, like, if, if it's this easy going forward? Hell, I have a car. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's the case, but why not, you know, try today and, uh, and then you can figure out how to, you know, work with technology and figure out how to get the right mix. Yeah. Well, thank you too. I appreciate it. This is, this has been a, a lot of fun. Uh, you know, Ron, it's a great time to be in the car business, right? It's, it's, this is, it's a fun time. There's a lot going on, you know, Ron, never Ron started the car business at like 15 by his year count, you know, I'm still trying to do the math on this, Ron. I love it. Hey, Mark, thank you for, um, thanks for creating this forum to have, you know, these types of conversations. I thought your questions were, were really good and I hope the audience, you know, had some value out of in, investing their time in this today, but thanks for um, allowing me to participate. I, I wow. second the motion and I look forward to the executive summit this fall. You guys always put on a great event and uh, can't wait to be part of that again. Well, we'll look forward to seeing you there. And everyone, thank you for joining us. Thanks for the comments. Love, love the engagement that we had on this. It really makes it uh, a lot more fun when we do that. And, and we hope to see everybody on future webinars. Ron, good to see you. Bryce, good to see you. We'll talk soon. Yep. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.